All right. We'll welcome everybody to the uh, November, gosh, November 2018 edition of FISMA Fridays. Uh, as always, want to uh, to thank you all for making some time in your busy schedules to join us here today. Uh, we know this is always a, a crazy time for many of you, uh, but we've got a really great session in store and uh, glad you're here. Uh, I'm Brian Sharp with uh, with Safety Chain, and I'll introduce my uh, my partner in crime here uh, shortly. But uh, we're going to jump in because we have uh, quite a, a packed schedule here to get through here for you today. Um, it's been cool as we've gone through some of the conference season to uh, to continue to meet a lot of you, and and it's it's great to hear that you're still getting so much value out of this. We've even heard stories about teams that are getting together in conference rooms, or this is part of the onboarding for new employees. Uh, so for those of you that are all listening together, I'm waving to you right now. Uh, thanks for, for continuing to be part of the community. Uh, for those of you that are, are new and checking this out maybe for the first time, this is the, the longest standing industry update and something we're really proud of that we partnered with TAG on, uh, gosh, over five years ago now. And the goal is just to continue to uh, bring to the surface any of the latest and greatest around FISMA. So whether it's just updates and news, the reg changes, uh, other updates in terms of the industry, uh, but also some of the trends that they are seeing in the field or that we're seeing with our customers. Um, but I think one of the great values here is the ability to uh, listen and learn from and interact with the experts over at the Atchison Group. And uh, we'll do a little bit of that at the end. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, a little over five years ago, we partnered with TAG, I'm sure many of you have either worked with them, seen them speak, read their work. Uh, they're just simply known as the, the leaders in consulting for, for food safety and uh, have added so much value to our clients and frankly to our company. And we're just uh, really excited to continue this partnership and continue growing FISMA Fridays. And we're on the technology side. So we are food quality management system and really kind of complement the strategic and in the trenches work and in the day-to-day -day operations you guys are all working on. Uh, we help you with uh, capturing and managing and analyzing that data so we can uh, do a better job for our companies and our customers. So uh, in terms of what we do, our agenda here, a couple of things to help you get the most out of the day. One is we try and keep a pretty informal uh, format. Uh, so we encourage you to ask some questions. We don't always have time to get to all the questions, so hang in there with us. Uh, one thing that our, our uh, presenter today, uh, Ben, has been kind enough to offer to help out uh, answering those that we don't get to during the course of the presentation. Uh, he'll take those offline or in our LinkedIn group, and we'll talk more about that at the end. Um, you'll also notice only the panelists are displayed, so it's just myself and our team. And uh, so if you have a question, don't be shy. Uh, it's not necessarily being broadcast to all of your peers, and we'll kind of monitor those on our side. And we are recording this. Um, if you haven't checked it out on our website at Safety Chain, you can go to our resources page. We have the entire FISMA Friday library, five years of content. There's some really good stuff in there. You can also um, type it up on uh, YouTube and check them all out there. Last but not least, uh, we were all just joking about some of the technology things that happen with these uh, online uh, presentation services. So if you have any audio issues, Sometimes the go-to move is just swapping. You can log in via phone or web, as I'm sure all of you are very well aware. Uh, but we also have someone behind the scenes um, that will monitor any technical issues you're having. And her name is Janaean, and she'll do her best to, uh, to help you out there. So uh, with that, what we got in store for today, we're going to touch on some of the latest and greatest with FISMA. Um, and then we try and do a focus around FISMA or a FISMA-related topic. Um, and this uh, month, we are going to talk a little bit about a survey that TAG put together and uh, some of their findings around that in, in terms of intentional adulteration and food defense. So uh, lots of good stuff coming. And as I mentioned, we'll work on getting to as many of your questions as we can uh, before the end of the presentation. So uh, with that, I'd like to, uh, to introduce really the, uh, the, the reason you're all here is, uh, is TAG. And... Uh, I'm excited to have um, Dr. Miller here for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is this is his first FISMA Friday welcome. So, uh, so Ben, if we had, if we were live, there'd be a rousing standing ovation right now just to give you a nice warm welcome. And uh, so we're excited to have you here for the first time, but also he's uh, relatively new to the tag team, but not new at all to the food safety world. So give a, a quick bio um, 
Dr. Benjamin Miller is a Senior Director of Food Safety with the Atchison Group and uh, has over uh, about 20 years of experience in the food safety regulation, uh, epidemiology, outbreak investigation and response, as well as public health. Uh, he earned his PhD from the University of Minnesota in environmental health with a focus on infectious diseases. And his experience is really fascinating, includes serving as the division director of the Food and Feed Safety Division at Minnesota Department of Agriculture, uh, as an epidemiologist at the Minnesota Department of Health. And he also held leadership roles with national regulatory associations, uh, including serving as director at large for the Associate Association of Food and Drug Officials. So um, we have uh, had the opportunity to get to know uh, Ben, and he said it was okay to call him Ben. So we've had the opportunity to get to know Ben a little bit over the last few weeks. I actually saw him present at a conference on uh, on these topics and uh, just a wealth of knowledge and super nice guy. So uh, Ben, welcome to the show. Can you uh, can you hear us okay? Absolutely. Thank you, Brian. And it's a All pleasure right. to be part of the FISMA Friday. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we're throwing you right in, man. We're not waiting. They, they brought you on. We're putting you right up front and center. So, <laughs> um, so with that, one of the first things we like to do, uh, we know you and your team are, you know, knee deep in this stuff every day, and uh, there's lots of changes and some super hot topics right now. So, just an opportunity to to share anything that's kind of uh, being bantered around the office for you, top of mind for your clients, any news or changes coming up that you maybe wanted to, to share with some of the, the group today? Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I think, you know, as we all uh, sat down to plan our Thanksgiving menus last week, we're well aware of the, the Romaine, uh, you know, market withdrawal and advisory from FDA and CDC. And, you know, I think that's kind of the, the big news when it comes to to FISMA right now in terms of you know what's happening in that particular industry segment, but also kind of how it relates back to you know the original law that was passed back in 2011. It's almost like we're back to the future a little bit here. You know when you look at uh, <laughs> when you look at Section 204 of FISMA itself, you know FDA was charged with setting up kind of a food traceability pilot system and doing some evaluation around that and. You know, I think what's interesting is you've seen, you know, a lot of, I call it proactive communication, you know, around the issues of traceability. Obviously, there was some communication about the Romaine outbreak that happened earlier this year. And then last week, uh, you know, there was a, essentially a do not consume Romaine advisory and followed up this week with, um, you know, some specific requests by FDA to industry in terms of voluntary labeling for Romaine products. You know, so that the consumer can identify, you know, where that product is potentially coming from in the supply chain. So there's a lot of moving parts, but what's interesting to me is that there's, if you look back, you know, a lot of what FISMA itself had, had given FDA authority to do um, still maybe isn't quite implemented yet. You know, I think we're seeing some of the, the consequences of that. And uh, it's uh, be interesting to see where it goes from an industry and regulatory standpoint. Yeah, for sure. It it made it made for uh, a lot of work topics at the Thanksgiving dinner table, for sure. So um, <laughs> definitely. Well, good. Well, I know that um, we had a chance at, at one of the recent conferences to uh, to see you and your team talk a little bit uh, about the survey work you've done uh, in, in the fall here recently, um, this kind of industry preparedness type of approach. And uh, this one was around uh, intentional adulteration in food defense. And uh, there's a lot of good stuff in here. So uh, we thought today would be a good opportunity for you to, to kind of share this in a bit of an informal format um, and kind of share some of your findings. And so I think there's so much good stuff in here. I'm going to stay out of the way and kind of give you controls, Ben, let you kind of click through this at your pace. But um, want to encourage the audience as you do have questions, um, fire them away in the questions box, and uh, we'll try and get to as many of those as we can at the end. But uh, uh, Ben, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you here. Great, thanks, Brian. So yeah, as you mentioned, this was a uh, a survey that TAG did in partnership with the Food Protection and Defense Institute. Uh, at the University of Minnesota, and we got to present on these results back at the Food Safety Consortium that was in Chicago a few weeks back. So this is a similar 
kind of distilled down presentation of the survey results um, you know, from that conference. But you know, for those that are familiar with this topic or have interest in it, the intentional adulter uh, adulteration rule, the, the first part of the guidance was um, published by FDA back in June of this year. And we'll talk, talk about that as we go um, through this slide deck. But if folks would like the survey results, uh, we've got a link at the end too where you can um, send in a uh, sign up by email and we'll be distributing kind of the full results of the survey uh, in December. So this is a, a little bit of a sneak peek. Just a little background on the intentional adulteration rule itself. You know, it's really there um, because it recognizes the threat that could exist if somebody were to intentionally contaminate the food supply. And so that's really the, the focus um, in terms of identifying potential vulnerabilities within you know, food processing systems and then some mitigation strategies uh, to reduce that risk. And it builds off of a, a HACCP style approach that most in the food industry are definitely familiar with, um, but takes a slightly different spin. And we'll, we'll talk about that here too. Compliance dates. Um, so very small businesses actually don't need to comply with the full rule. They just need to document that they they don't need to comply with it. So they're um, they're not covered by definition of in the rule itself. But compliance dates for small businesses and everyone else coming up. So July of next year would be the compliance dates for somebody that's not classified as a small business or very small business. And um, as I mentioned before, that. The guidance document that came out from FDA in June is, is partially complete. It was good that they got it out, but there are sections that still yet have to be released. So it's about, um, I think about a third released and two thirds still waiting for some of the details around um, passive mitigation uh, strategy steps. Just a little background on the response, who responded. We had 250 response, respondents to the survey, which is great. Um, about three quarters in the US, uh, about 10% in Canada, and then 20% the rest of um, outside of Canada and the US. And then you can see the role of the respondents here. So the, the majority, or almost the full majority, kind of in food quality, food safety, um, as they've self-identified in the survey. So you can see that you know food defense is definitely a responsibility that's falling to you know traditional food safety um, roles within companies. Breakdown just on the size of companies that responded here. So you can see that, um, you know, those that have under 100 employees were about 42%, over 500, about 34%, and under 500, 24%. But the majority of respondents kind of fall in that processor, manufacturer, or distributor category um, with you know, grower and retail and other making up a, you know, smaller portion of those that responded to the survey. And that makes sense when we when we look at who needs to, or who's covered by um, the IA rule from a regulatory standpoint. So we, when we looked at the survey results, we kind of identified um, there were four key theme areas that, that emerged. And one, I'll just go through them briefly, and then we'll go through in a little bit more detail. Run around awareness building, second around training, uh, third around revising existing plans, and then four around testing those um, those plans. So awareness building, generally the respondents were aware of the IA rule requirements, um, and the majority of respondents recognized that their company would be covered by the intentional adulteration rule. So I think that was good, um, you know, that there was a strong awareness within the respondents that, that this is a rule out there, this is something that they're going to need to comply with, and they were aware that there were resources available for that, so that's it's good to see. When you look at um, a high-level breakdown just of awareness around the draft guidance document that I've talked about, you know, the majority, 65%, were aware of that, and of those that responded, you know, over half had commented on the rule draft guidance document during the public comment phase. So again, the majority of the respondents um, were aware of this guidance document, what some of the rule requirements are, 
Now this analysis that you're looking at here doesn't really break out um, these responses based on industry segment or company size or things like that. Uh, that's something that we will, in the process of analyzing and can share in the uh, full survey results next month. The second theme that emerged was a need for training. Um, and that question, one of the questions was, have you attended training specific to developing or improving your food defense plans? And right there, it's about a 50-50 split. So about half of the respondents had attended some kind of training relative to their food defense plans. And uh, internally, I think, you know, you're seeing 72% have trained employees in food defense awareness. So more training around awareness, um, less of attended relative to developing food safety defense plans themselves. And to move on that, Eric, to continue that theme around training, uh, is to focus on individuals at an actionable process step. So when the guidance documents that came out talked about action, actionable process steps, and those are the, the steps in the process that are potentially vulnerable to attack by somebody that's, um, you know, typically an inside attacker is what the guidance document is focusing on. So somebody that could have access to um, key activity types, which is something this guidance document also talks about. We'll get there in a second. But um, that training really focused on line workers and supervisors, people that are out on the floor working in those environments and, you know, can see or should have knowledge of what should or shouldn't be occurring at those particular actionable process steps. So two elements in the training, one was general awareness, um, you know, making sure that everyone in a company has general awareness around food defense. And for that, you know, there's FDA online courses that are available and that's recognized as sufficient. When we go to that second step around, um, you know, actually protecting these actionable process steps, more specific training is needed. So how do you implement the mitigation strategies that a company might decide to use at one of those steps? And then who is the food defense qualified individual for that company or for that facility? And so the guidance document goes into some pretty good detail on those uh, particular points. And so if you haven't had a chance, I would definitely recommend downloading a copy of that. Uh, taking a look, reading through it. It's about 90 pages right now, but um, it's, it's well worth the read if you want to get more in-depth information on this particular topic. So need for plan revision. Uh, one of the questions was, do you have a food defense plan today for your facility? And you can see here that the vast majority of people do. Um, but when the second question was asked, is your plan prior to the FISMA IA rule coming out, you know, the majority of respondents and a smaller portion, 28%, responded that it had been updated based on um, that guidance. You know, that's going to have to be something that, that's looked at. The, the regulation actually requires the plan to be reviewed and updated once every three years. But as I mentioned before, the full guidance document hasn't been released at this point. So certainly there's a lot of work that can be done based on the, the current draft of the guidance that's out there. And, and there's definitely a need based on these survey results to have industry look at uh, their plans that are in place and potentially make updates to those. And then um, did you have a plan prior to the uh, FISMA rule? That's a similar question you can see again. Um, that's a carryover from the last slide. And then the, the uh, second question here, does your plan contain a vulnerability assessment and mitigation strategies? So again, the majority of, of plans that are in place have those, which is great. Um, I think that the emerging thing to know about the guidance document that's, that's out there is this concept around uh, key activity types or CATs. So based on FDA's work in developing the guidance document, they sat down with over, uh, I think, 50 different companies and went through vulnerability assessments. And what they determined was there are kind of four areas uh, that fall under the highest risk, if you will, and that's you know, bulk liquid receiving and unloading processes, um, bulk liquid or uh, storage on facility site, mixing um, of product, and then uh, force type, which I apologize is not jumping to mind for me right now. I can definitely pull that up at the end. Um, 
but those are well defined and, and FDA says if you have one of these particular activity types that falls under um, as defined as a cat, then those are the things that you need to focus on in the vulnerability assessment. So it simplifies in some ways um, a company's need to think about every particular step in a process. So if it falls under one of those cats, if you will, um, those are the things that would require a mitigation strategy. And then finally, that, that fourth theme that emerged was the need for a preparedness exercise. And um, the question was, have you tested your food defense plan? And you can see that the majority of people haven't or aren't sure. And so, you know, what that looks like can vary. I know um, we have staff at uh, the Atchison group that will actually do kind of a white hat exercise, try to penetrate a facility posing as um, somebody that shouldn't be there, but try to get in and see what particular areas of a facility they might be able to access. So that's something that I know we've worked with companies in the past to do exercises like that. Um, and those are great ways to test, you know, how robust is your food defense plan? I think um, one of our, one of my colleagues likes to say, you know, once you're in, you're in saying, you know, if you can gain access to a facility, you know, posing as somebody that, um, has a legitimate reason to be there, even though you're not necessarily a legitimate actor in that particular capacity. And once you're in, you can usually move around a facility and gain access to some of those key areas. And that's really what the guidance document and the intent of the IA rule is, is there to prevent. It's really prevention based and making sure that the mitigation strategies that exist prevent that kind of activity from happening. And, and mitigation strategies can be something as simple as awareness around who should be in a particular portion of a facility. So putting some of your more senior or vetted staff at higher risk actionable process steps is one of the uh, mitigation strategies the guidance document talks about. So that's a very high and quick overview of the survey results. As I said before, uh, more in-depth analysis will be available for that survey. And if you want to uh, send an email to at info at atchisongroup.com, you can sign up for our weekly newsletter and definitely can receive the, re uh, the survey results through that. Um, other questions in the survey included, you know, have your facility experienced any kind of intentional adulteration um, activity or breach in the past? Um, what's the individual's facility what is the individual facility's preparedness level? And you know, what's, what are the understandings of risks and potential costs with compliance um, for the, the IA rule? So a lot of good information there. We're looking forward to getting that pulled together in partnership with the uh, Food Protection Defense Institute over the next couple of weeks and, and having that ready for circulation soon. Perfect. So with that, no, Brian, be... I can turn it back to you. No, that was good. I, I... The distilled down version was still a lot of good info there. So thanks for, for doing that. Um, I, I know one question that comes up a, a lot, and I was curious what you typically suggest to clients while these guidance documents are in process, you know, what, what do you guys recommend to companies to do? Should they wait till all this is done? Should they get started? You know, what, how do you kind of, um, and I know I'm sure each case is, certainly individual, but uh, what's kind of your general thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. You know, when you look at uh, the guidance document and what's out there right now, there's a lot of good information that companies can start to proactively use and, and start developing or re revising their existing food defense plans. So the vulnerability assessment using those key activity types and going through and developing some of the mitigation strategies around those actionable process steps that require, mm -hmm. a, that fall under the definition of a key activity type. Um, those would be things that, you know, you can certainly start on now. And, uh, you know, the guidance document does a, a good job of walking you through what that would look like, you know, pulling together a food defense team, you know, walking through the process, mapping out the process, identifying those steps. And that's probably, you know, the majority of, of the heavy lift, if you will. And then mm -hmm. the parts of the guidance document that have to come out next are focused more on, you know, how do you monitor those processes and, you know, what are the corrective actions if you have a deviation uh, from those processes? So 
certainly people can start now. <laughs> it's, it's right. It's good not to wait. Okay. That's good. Yeah, that's the, it's good that they won't spin their wheels. That you can still be productive with what information they have. So, um, and this is always helpful benchmarking too. So I think it gives a good place to start. Uh, another good question came in here was, um, and this is great because there's always this. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of themes lately about you know training the the auditors too, right? So feedback that um, a distributor uh, they use the FDA Plan Builder tool to create their food defense plans and their BRC auditor um, so recently told us that the tool was not good enough for BRC requirements. So the question specifically is, do you know of other tools to help create this kind of plan uh, or is the FDA planning to update the tool? Are you familiar with that tool at all and any feedback on that? I am, yeah, and it's my understanding that FDA is planning on updating that tool based on the guidance document. So once the full, the full, next two parts of that guidance document get released, then they'll be updating their plan builder tool to match that. Uh, and while I am not directly familiar with all of the BRC requirements around a food defense plan, I know we've got um, some, some members of the, the tag team that are. So if that's a question that, um, you know, that, that whoever asked the question, if they'd like to send me an email, I can pass that along to our resource in-house too. Okay. Good. And just, just out of curiosity, as you release a study like this, uh, what's the most common question or concern you and your team are getting out there? You know, where, or where are you suggesting people start? You know, I, I think a, a good place to start is a review of that existing plan if they have one and certainly starting to develop one if they, if they don't. Uh, also being familiar with, you know, what, some of the potential vulnerabilities or hazards might be. Uh, the guidance document talks about FDA's kind of food defense database, and, and that's a valuable resource that can be accessed as well in terms of figuring out, you know, what are some of the probable threats that could happen in your particular operation? Um, and, you know, in turn, what are some of the potential mitigation strategies that could be used in those settings? So, you know, I think like anything in life, you know, it's getting a start on what can seem like a, a daunting task to begin with. Um, exactly. But yeah, uh, there are quite a few resources out there, though, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's definitely work that we do as well as helping companies identify what some of the gaps are in their current plans. Mm -hmm. That would be good. Excellent. Well, thank you for uh, for that, Ben. Definitely appreciate it. I think it's a timely topic for sure. Um, for those of you that are not part of it, we do have a LinkedIn group that uh, we put together with TAG around FISMA Friday. So these are the kind of topics we'd love to continue that conversation. We know, you know, with the, with the thousands of people that are part of this community for FISMA Fridays, there's a lot of expertise, a lot of uh, experience, a lot of questions too, right? So we want to encourage you to hop on there uh, when we're done and, um, you know, get part of... Uh, the conversation there on LinkedIn and we'll, we'll keep those going and, and as Ben just mentioned this is the work they do at, at TAG so we, we could not recommend them more and the value they they're able to bring to uh, to some of our our customers is uh, is so great um, this is a good time of year whether you're starting to, to figure out what you're going to focus on for next year you're looking at some of these changes and guidance documents um, they certainly can be a big help and, and shave a lot of time and frustration off of that uh, potentially daunting process so they've got a a really great new website if you haven't checked that out either at uh, atchisongroup.com so highly recommend you you check out and connect with them there and on the flip side on the technology side we really complement the strategic work and and the day-to-day -day operations you're all doing to help capture and manage and analyze all this data so you can improve your operations and, and compliance and, and also the productivity right make this easier on your teams uh, but get your management the the data they need to make sure you you're doing all the right stuff. So we we have some pretty pretty exciting stuff we're working on, including I think I'm allowed to say this, but we're uh, we're launching a product with Tag, uh, a risk assessment tool that we're really excited about. It's been in the works for a while, and um, next week we are doing a a sneak preview product launch. It's gonna be a real short 30 minutes like this, kind of show you uh, how we are combining our technology with Tag's expertise and some of their proprietary uh, approaches around risk assessment. So. Um, you can learn more about that also at our at our website. 
Uh, and again, that'll be uh, next week. I think it's next Wednesday. So uh, lots of good stuff there uh, coming together with, uh, with both of us. Speaking of what's coming, um, we'll be uh, putting this up into the FISMA Friday Library. So for those of you that love to share these with your colleagues uh, or you can't get enough and you want to watch again, you're certainly welcome to do so. You'll access that on our site. We'll send out a link uh, as well. Um, also, we have our Beyond Compliance webinar series that's uh, a little bit more of a, a tactical approach. And uh, this month, we are bringing in a customer from Albertsons to share uh, a really cool success story about how they use technology to improve their operations uh, around uh, a lot of facilities. And uh, we mentioned that the demo day we're doing with TAG. Um, and Ben alluded to their newsletter. I can't recommend that enough. There's so much good content. So that's a must have in your inbox. Uh, so make sure and, and uh, hop over to sign up for that. And uh, we will all get together. We're going to do kind of an early holiday edition of FISMA Fridays on Friday the 21st. So mark your calendars for that. And uh, if you're already signed up, you'll get the, the reminders uh, a couple days out. And uh, we'd love to have you all join us as we, we go into the new year. It's hard to believe December is tomorrow. <laughs> so um, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Ben and the Atchison Group. Uh, for always adding a ton of value. We're, we really appreciate you and the partnership. And uh, we thank all of you for, for being part of the community and showing up each and every month to support us. So uh, have a, uh, a wonderful rest of the day and a great weekend. We'll see you uh, in just over a few weeks. Thanks again, everybody.